Okay, sorry, we're late to get started. Let me make some extra copies, guys. Um, all right. Now, I need to go back a little bit over last week over what we went over in Chapter 17 and kind of help you get a little better handle on some of the things that we were talking about in Chapter 17 of Revelation. One of the first things that we met is this woman in scarlet. We talked about the fact that she's riding on a seven-headed beast. Okay, um, she's the exact opposite of the Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ is adorned in the purest of white according to Scripture. She's a woman in scarlet. She's the mother of all obscenities in the world and prostitution. She's drunk on the wine of the people of God from killing them and murdering them. And we talked about the fact that this is the world system of both Commerce and false religion, all wrapped up in this one person. Okay. And John is astounded when he sees this particular part of the vision. Uh, we know it's not a particular woman. We know that it's something that appears to be, uh, he's describing it as a woman. And as we see here, it says in verse chapter 17, verse uh, 4, the woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand she held a go gold goblet full of the obscenities and impurities of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon, the great mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. And I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses before witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in a complete amazement. Okay? So this is something John has not been... I mean, I would be able to say everything John's seen so far, if I was the guy there that was seeing it, was being told by God and the angels what it was, I would have just been absolutely amazed from the very beginning. And I'm sure he was. But this was something that was so spectacular that stuck out so much to him that it just absolutely blew his mind. And this beast is seated on, or this woman is seated on this seven-headed beast. And as we read about this, we, read, we find this beast in Revelation chapter 13, because when we see it in chapter 13, it's when Satan's been doing battle with the angels in heaven, and Satan is defeated and cast down to earth, and this beast rises up out of the sea, uh, and we call it the Antichrist. And that's what John calls it, the Antichrist. Which is what? The opposite of Christ. Okay? And we get a little better description every time John starts talking about this beast. And here in chapter uh, 17, which we're going to go back to verse 7. Why are you amazed? The angel asked. I tell you the mystery of this woman and the beast with the seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. The beast you saw was once alive, but isn't now. He will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go to eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names are not written in the book of life before the world was made, will all be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. This calls for a mind with understanding. Okay, let's talk about these seven heads. We have five heads. Then we have one head and one head that are being described. Okay, we talked about last week. That five are already destroyed, and that's when Jesus defeated Satan and Calvary. But we also know that there is a spirit of Antichrist working in our world today. And that spirit has been working ever since. Um, there's fruit in that page right there when we're about the inside. Um, that spirit of Antichrist has been working ever since John was in the world. Remember, we went back and looked at 2 John, 3 John, where it talks about the Antichrists that have gone out into the world already. So, what this shows us is that you know Satan was kind of in control of this world before Jesus came, right? We read the scripture where Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. 
And Satan said, if it was get down by your knees, I'll give it all to you. Well, that shows you the pride of Satan right there because he knows he's defeated. He knows he's cast down. He knows who Jesus was. And he still tried to get Jesus to bow down to him because he wants God to bow down to him. And Jesus quoted scripture back to him and said, you will worship the Lord your God only. But we also know that when Jesus defeated Satan at Calvary, he was not defeated completely and totally. He still has the ability to work in our world. If you don't believe that, just look at what's going on in our world. The things that we've been talking about. If there was no evil in our world today, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Because the millennium would be going on and we wouldn't even need to know about all this stuff. Right? Well, the spirit of Antichrist is in the work in the world today, but when this Revelation 13 beast rises up again, then it's going to look like he's reincarnated or resurrected. And that's when all hell is going to break loose during the tribulation time. Okay? So, John, can, like I said, here it is. John introduced us to the beast. And now he's coming out and giving us a bigger introduction and a bigger description of what's going on. And basically the woman in Scarlet, the whore, the prostitute, the mother of all obscenities and prostitution, is in league with Satan. That means the world system. That's why Jesus tells us, come out of the world, right? That's why Paul says, be in the world, but not of the world. Anybody who's a friend of the world is an enemy of God, is what John said. Come out of this because it's run by this. And for all intents and purposes, for anybody who's a believer, Satan is defeated in our lives, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't he be? Because we have the resurrection power that Jesus gave us when he, when he defeated and got the, the keys to death, hell, and the grave. We don't have to be afraid of it anymore. But we look around us everywhere and we see evil working. And isn't it amazing that most of it's already under control, but there's some still working and there's some that haven't showed up yet. What do we keep saying? If you think it's bad now, with six of them, five being defeated, just wait and see what's going to happen when the last one turns loose, when the last time of evil operating in the world is turned loose. I hope that helps everybody a little bit over what we were talking about last week. Because, like I said, you know, people who are dispensationalists, they want to make each of these be different kings of the Roman Empire, different Nero, or Nero and different people like that. They want it to be the Pope. They want it to be all kinds of things. But what John is doing is he's talking to a group of people that are under persecution from the world system, false religion. If you remember at Smyrna, they wouldn't worship the emperor. They wouldn't burn incense to the emperor. They wouldn't say Caesar is Lord because they believed that Jesus was Lord. So they had, the, they had lost their homes. They lost their ways of making money. And they were thrown in jail because they wouldn't bow down and worship the world standard of religion. And it's going to happen again. But what did I say this morning? There are so many churches in our world today that are stuck in Revelation chapter 3. Let's read the Revelation chapter 3 real quick. I'm going to give you a description of what's going on in the world today as far as the church is concerned from Revelation chapter 3 starting in verse 14. Now I want you to think as we're reading this. I want you to think about all the false teaching that's on the TV. I want you to think about all the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it teachers that are out there. I want you to think about all the people who are using psychology instead of the Bible to try to help people's lives be changed. Listen to what it says. Write this letter to the angel of the church at Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness. Who is that? It's Jesus, right? And the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, and you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I would spit you or vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. Isn't that what positive confession in the church today tells you to say? I'm not hungry. I'm not hurt. I'm not sick. I don't have cancer. I don't have problems. My kids are the best kids in the world. And they think if you just keep saying that over and over and over and over again, it's going to come true. But I'll use the same example that I've always used. If you're trying to start a chainsaw, 
and it hits, and then it drops because your arm dropped when you pull on it and it hits your leg, and it chews a big chunk out of the top of your leg, you can stand there all day long or until you bleed out and say, I didn't just do that. My chainsaw did not just bite me. I'm not bleeding out on the ground. Let me see. You're a nurse. Does that help? Yeah. What do you need? A tourniquet, right? And a trip to the ambulance, an ambulance real quick. So you can positively confess all day long. And you know what? There are people out there that have been taught all their lives that if you say something negative, negative stuff will happen. And if you only say positive, only positive things will happen. I will tell you that is a big load of baloney. Because good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. That's the way it is in our world today. Okay? And so we look at this and that's their indication, that's their understanding, that's their perception of who they are. But look at the next part of the verse. It says, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Does God see the truth or is God mistaken? See the truth. I mean, just because a church has 10,000 people in it or coming to it, does that make it a godly place? No. Just because a church only has 100 people coming to it, does that make it a godly place? No. It has nothing to do with the size of the crowd. As I said this morning, it has everything to do with the heart of whoever's there to worship. And if you don't belong to Jesus Christ, you cannot worship God. You may like the songs. You may tap your foot. You may clap your hands. But if God is not the center of your life and Jesus is not your Savior and your Lord, you can't worship God. Amen. Because there is sin between you and God. Okay? And there's sin in our churches. And some of the biggest sinners are the preachers that are out there lying and selling a lot of stuff to people that is actually sending them to hell instead of helping them find their way to heaven. Because they're preaching get better and be better. You know, I now... Joel Osteen, I'm telling you, he just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper into it. You know, be the best you you can be. And now there's some game they've got where they play to become the best you you can be that, that he's got out sitting up there at Ollie's. That tells you how much it's worth it's sitting at Ollie's for that whole box. Okay? But look at what it says here. Verse 18. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold that's been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also, buy white garments for me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness, and ointment for your eyes so you can be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. You know what? God says, to be who I want you to be, you have to have what I want you to have. You can't make it up on your own. You can't do it yourself. You can't decide whether you're good enough or not good enough. All right? Now, let me give you the flip side of that. I have met so many people in 30 years of ministry who think they will never be good enough. I used to know a woman when I was a kid and I went to one of the bigger churches here in town. She would go get saved every Sunday because that's what they taught, that you could lose your salvation. And she was a go-go dancer and she would go out to the bars and be a dancer and she'd do you know, other things and she'd come back and think she had to get saved all over again. Somebody didn't help her understand what it looks like to be saved in the first place, or she would have never been involved in that kind of stuff. And in the second place, somebody lied to her and told her that she had a, a, an ability to save or unsave herself. And the Bible says that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. Period. Okay? No amount of good works gets us to heaven. No amount of doing bad things can keep us from heaven if we belong to Christ. Because here's the deal. If... Christ is our Savior and our Lord. We're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit indwells us, we can't stay in sin for very long. Does that make sense to everybody? And so as we look at this, the church that seemed to be the church out of all the churches that had it all together, out of all those seven churches that we read about, Jesus looked at them and he told, you know, he told Ephesus, you lost your first love. You know, he told one of the other churches, you let that Jezebel teach in your church. And now he's telling them, you think you got it all together, but I'm here to tell you, you are sorely mistaken. You're in awful shape, and until you let me fix it, you're going to always be in awful shape. And that's what I was talking about this morning. You know, you find me two or three or five people who just kept their relationship with God and or got it one straight down with God, and I'll show you people who want to do everything God wants. And you show me a whole group of 500 people who sit in church every Sunday and they just hear what they hear, and they don't act on what they hear because the Bible says don't just be 
hearers of the word, also be doers of the word. I'll show you a bunch of people that are just like the way I see in church. And the United States is full of churches that are full of way I see in Christians. Now, this, now, here's another little break for you. The, the people who believe that everybody's going to be out before the tribulation and won't have to worry about all this, they will take all those seven churches and say those are seven different time periods in the church. I'm here to tell you that every one of those churches is represented in every time period. Because there's churches being persecuted right now all over the world, aren't they? People, you can watch them on TV and then get people getting their heads cut off because they're Christians, put in jail because they're Christians. Um, and so as we see that, we want to remember that this is what runs that system. They are not teaching about God. They're saying God words, and they're using it in a context that looks godly, but it has nothing to do with God. It's all about the person. It's all about I. It's like when Jesus was walking down the road with the disciples, and they stopped in front of the temple, and there was a rich man there, and then there was a publican who was a tax collector, hated by the whole world, right? We all love tax collectors, don't we? Well... The, the, the publican or the rich man stand there and say, God, I thank you. I'm not like that dirtbag over there. I tithe and I pray and I do and I do and I do. What was he doing? Praying to him himself. He was breaking his arm and patting himself on the back. And the other guy, who's despised by everybody, it says he was beating on his breast and he wouldn't even look up and say, God, forgive me because I'm a horrible sinner. And Jesus said, only one of those prayers got hurt. And it wasn't the first guy. But you see, everybody out there now is chasing after this whole get rich quick scheme in the church. Or the, we're not going to talk about anything. Or, we just have to have open arms and open minds. Well, let me tell you what. Don't let your head be so open that your brain falls out on the floor. Josh McDowell wrote a book one time called Don't Check Your Brain at the Door. Most people don't even put their brain in anymore. They live off their feelings. And I'm going to tell you what, this will work your feelings. My God, it will work your feelings. It will have you crawl around on the ground, sort of like snakes and everything else. They do it in these kind of uh, venues. But when your head and your heart are hooked together, you gain knowledge from God, and it changes who you are, and it can't stay in you. Does that make sense? And that's why people who truly belong to God are going to be persecuted so horribly by this system. Hmm. Stand up and try to talk about God. You know, when I'm in there on Thursday at the radio station, and I start talking to Dave, a lot of times he'll say, well, can I talk? I said, no, nope, I'm going to talk today. And this is what we're going to talk about. And he asked me why I am so unwilling to change, unwilling to back down, compromise, or anything, from what the, God, what the Bible says. And I said, because I'm never going to do that. I have to stand in front of God and give account for what I'm teaching. And God's Word does not change to match the people who are in the culture. The culture needs to change itself to match it's God's Word. And, you know, it makes me sound like a fundamentalist with a capital F. But I'm not. I'm not. You know, most fundamentalists with a capital F will be wearing a suit up here teaching you guys on Sunday night a Bible study out of the King James Version. Right? But I take God's word that you can understand and a version that you can understand it. And we unpack it like this, just who we are, so that we can understand how to live for God and do what God wants. Isn't that better? Let me tell you, I've been to one of them and I've been here. And most of them are not like here. And we need to know, because God wants us to know, if God didn't want us to know what was going to go on before the millennium, before Jesus comes back, he never left it in a book for us to read. If we're not going to be here, we don't need to worry about it. We just say, okay, I'm good, I'm going, I'm out of here, I don't have to worry about it. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. But everywhere we've looked, since chapter 4, where some people think the church gets translated out, we've seen God's people being tormented, persecuted. Now, she's drunk on the blood of God's people, those who worship Jesus Christ. Okay? Back to chapter 17, real quick, finishing up. Um, let's talk about this, this seven-headed beast. All right, verse 11. The scarlet beast was, that would be the five heads, was defeated by Jesus at Calvary, and, um, but is no longer. Now, what does Satan want everybody to believe in the world today? That he doesn't even exist. Correct? 
He wants everybody to believe that he doesn't exist, and if he does exist, he's in a little red jumpsuit with a pointy tail and horns. Okay? That's not who he is. He exists as an angel of light that comes to try to draw people away from God and draw even God's people away from God. Um, I read an article this week about the third member of DC Talk. Of course, there's Toby Mack, who has been serving God all along, and then there's Michael Tate, who's in the Newsboys, who is talking about deconstructing his Christianity, and then there's the third guy that nobody knows his name, and sadly I can't remember his name. But now he is an opponent of Christ, an opponent of the church, an opponent of God, which means when he was in D.C. talk back in the 90s, he never belonged to God in the first place. Because now he's preaching the exact opposite, teaching the exact opposite. You see, that's how it works in this system. They think they're doing the right thing, and then when they get disgruntled because things don't go their way, then they automatically become against God, and it's okay to still do that and be a part of the system. You can't bless God and curse God out of the same mouth. Can you? No, we can't. All right? Now, it says he's the eighth king. He's like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. The ten horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. Those are the demonic powers from Ephesians chapter 6. It says that we don't struggle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of heavenly places. So the heaven the ten horns are what we find in Ephesians chapter 6. Okay, that's demonic rulers, demonic kings that are working and will align themselves completely, totally, and give all of their credit to the beast at some point during the, during the tribulation time, just before Jesus comes back. Okay, uh, it says they will agree to give him their power and authority. Together they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because the Lord, he is Lord of all lords and King of all kings. What's that battle? Armageddon. We've already talked about Armageddon. We talked about that in chapter 16. We're still talking about the same battle. When we get to chapter 19, we're still going to be talking about the exact same battle. There's not three battles against the Lamb. There's one. John's just given us a little bit of information, a little bit more information, and a little bit more information as to why things are going to go, why they go the way they do, and how they're going to happen. Okay? Now, the Lamb will defeat them because He is the Lord of all Lord and King of all kings, and He that he, his called and chosen and faithful ones, will be with him. Then the angel said to me, The waters where the prostitute is ruling represents the masses of people of every nation and language. It says the seven-headed beast sits on seven hills, but the woman sits over the ocean. Now the ocean has always represented commerce. The world system of sharing monies. World, one world government. Okay? Globalism. That's what this is. She's seated on the waters. Okay? Um, oh, she's seated on the beast. But she's also over the commerce, the, the trade. We have a president that's going to do the a deal with the devil so we can have oil. He's going to go beg the Saudis to give us oil when we've got enough oil that we'll never have to dig or bury or borrow oil for another three to five hundred years, he's going to go do a deal with them. Okay? Think about that. What happens when you deal with the devil? It comes back to bite you somewhere. There's always a string attached. Okay? And so when we see what's going on here, we can see the spirit of Antichrist in our world today. It's working. But... We know there's a beast that's going to come up out of the pit. And that's what it talks about, the beast that's coming up out of the pit. And that's going to be the renewed or resurrected form of evil that's going to happen during this time. All right, now, let's um, jump in here on the paper that you have. Uh, first line, Revelation 17, 1, one of the angels who poured out the bowl of wrath told John of the destruction of the great harlot. 17, 18 also represents the harlot as the great immoral city of Babylon. Let's look at verse 18. And this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. You see that right there? She sits on the beast, but she rules over the kings of the world, which is all the world trade that's going on in our world today. Let me ask you a question. How is it that already this year, as of the 1st of June, there's already been 
70 pounds of fentanyl caught at the border. How does that get through? Do you know it just takes one piece of fentanyl smaller than a grain of rice to kill you? Dead. With no chance of being brought back. How is it that 70 pounds of it have made it through the border? And that's just the ones they know about. You see, where does that come from? Anybody know where the particles that make up fentanyl come from? China. How is China getting everything to make fentanyl into Mexico so they can come here to the United States and kill our kids? You see, they're, they're after our kids. Everywhere you look, they're after the younger generations because people like us are smart enough to know better. We should be. But you know, I know some 60-year-olds that act like they're 12. Right? One tiny, tiny little particle of fentanyl will kill you. George Floyd died from putting fentanyl in his mouth while that cop had his leg, neck on, leg on his neck. It, both things kept combined to kill him, but the fentanyl is what really killed him. And you're never going to hear that. You're never going to hear that. Because that's the wrong thing to say. Because the spirit of Antichrist doesn't want anybody to know the truth. And they want to keep everybody so confused. And they want to keep everybody so worked up. And they want to keep everybody so wondering. How does something slip out of 39 clerks in the entirety of the Supreme Court that says they may be thinking about stopping National Roe versus Wade? That just slipped out in it. And out of 39 clerks, nobody knows which one did Guess what? Most of those judges are conservative. Some of them are liberal. It wouldn't be hard to figure out which group it came out of, but nobody wants to know. Do you know why? Because the spirit of Antichrist doesn't want anybody to know, because what's it do? It automatically paints us as believers as domestic terrorists. All you hear on the news is how we're going to be the ones who burn things down, how we're going to be the ones who tear things up. I'm telling you what, I've watched the news for a long time in my life, and I've never seen Christian people who were doing that. Never. But what, that, what the devil does with the spirit of Antichrist, it flips things around, it turns things around. And if you remember when this reincarnated, resurrected part, this one that looks like it had a mortal wound comes up out of the ground, everybody's going to think he's the real God. And a lot of people who played church all their lives are going to follow that instead of following Christ. And so... We're going to move here just a little bit into Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 24. And what we're going to read here is a triumphant but sorrowful funeral dirge for Babylon. All right? Babylon is the great immoral city, and now we're going to hear a funeral dirge. How many of you love a good funeral dirge? Huh? I've been to a lot of churches where that's what they call worship. It's funeral dirge. You know, it's dead. It's nothing there. It's no life in it. It's old songs that mean nothing to anybody. Watch this. Verses 1 through 3, an angel with great authority shouts. Do you notice as John starts describing these angels, they're ones with more and more and more authority? It's not just an angel. It's an angel that came from the temple. It's not just an angel. It's an angel that dumped out the bowl. Now it's a mighty angel, okay? And this mighty angel shouts, verse 1 through 3, After all this I saw another angel come down from heaven with a great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor, and he gave a mighty shout. Babylon has fallen, that great city has fallen. She's become a home for demons. She is a hideous, for every, or a, a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture, and, a, and every foul and dreadful animal. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality, the kings of the world have committed adultery with her because of her desires for extravagant luxury. The merchants of the world have grown rich. Right there it is. Isn't that amazing? Because they do business with the devil. Because they know all the loopholes. Because they know how to do it and not get caught. Because they launder money. Right? Isn't it amazing how a laptop that came out almost two years ago that was made to be poo-poo in front of the whole world is now revealing so much stuff that really happened and is real and is very implicating to what's going on? Isn't that amazing? Does that blow anybody's mind? You know, so the Bible says whatever is done under the cover of secret will be exposed in the light. 
Okay? We have, there's no such thing as secret sin. It's always exposed somewhere. But what happens is the spirit of Antichrist wants to keep it covered up. It doesn't want this little bright light of this angel coming and exposing the sin for what it is. And that's what happens when somebody truly meets Jesus. The light overcomes the darkness. God's love and God's grace and God's mercy overcomes all the evil desires that anybody could have. It doesn't mean we're automatically perfect. It doesn't, because we won't be perfect until the day we stand before Jesus. And we won't be standing before him very long because it says that we'll bow before him and everything that we'll thank him for everything that he's ever done and we'll worship him because he's God. And we know it. And we'll really know it then. We know it now, but we really don't understand it as well as we'll know it that day. And as light has been turned down in our world, you know, it's like the world for the past 60 years has had this giant reset. You know what a reset is, right? When you go into your... Explain to them, Bert, what a reset is. Oh, it's, it's a device that turns the lights down, dims, raises. It dims them. It doesn't just turn them off. It dims them. You can push it and turn it off. But you turn that knob and you can take that light down, 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 down. You've seen that Benjamin Moore commercial where they buy this green paint that they want to use, but they don't buy it from Benjamin Moore. And the only way they can tell that it looks like Benjamin Moore paint is to turn all the lights off. Well, guess what? When you turn all the lights off, everything looks the same. Right? But the Antichrist that exists in the world now, the spirit of Antichrist, has been turning the reset down just a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. But here's the problem. Has anybody noticed in the last 10 years how fast that reset's getting turned down? And one of the things that I've noticed is the older my eyes get, the more light I need to read. Even with my glasses on, I need more light to read. Okay? That's why I stand under this light right here when I'm teaching you guys. Not so everybody can see my beautiful face on the TV. Um, that ain't, that's not it. I have a face for radio, and I know it. Um, but why is it? There are a majority of people in the world shouting, it's getting dark. We can't see anymore. We don't know what's right and what's wrong. We can't see it. Because Satan is doing his best work that he's ever done in the world right now. Now, we're starting to find out after two and a half, three and a half years, what COVID can do and what the shots that go along with COVID can do. Right? So what did they do on Friday? They did a test on kids from zero to five years old. And they found out that two shots wasn't enough to protect them more than three weeks, three months. And so they said, now they got to have three shots. And the first thing they did was the FDA, the, the, uh, the FDA and then the CDC both jumped on the board Friday and said, yes, we're going to do it and we need to do it and every kid needs to get vaccinated. And here's the sad thing. The studies already show that only one-third of the people in the United States are willing to put their child in that kind of jeopardy. But they're going to force it on everybody. Because I'm going to tell you, now that they passed it, grade school kids, like high school kids and like college kids and like middle school kids, are going to be forced to get a vaccine before they can go to school. And we know the side effects. It causes heart disease. It causes myocardia in men, young men. It causes pericardial problems. It causes breathing problems. It causes blood clots. It causes all kinds of stuff. And here's another piece. Keith was in the hospital, had a stroke. They were going to give him blood. They gave him blood that they shouldn't have given him. He had no reason to be receive blood, and they gave it to him anyhow. But one of the questions that Kayla asked after they'd already done it was, did the person who donated that blood get the vaccine? And she said, the, the nurse said, we don't know. Nobody tells us that. We can't find that information. So they're going to get that vaccine in people one way or the other. So if you get a blood transfusion, it could have the vaccine in it. Okay? If the person that they took the blood from has those antibodies in it. Because they don't filter out the antibodies. They just take the red blood cells. Okay? <clears throat> As we look at this, this angel shouts, and then it's reflecting the glory of God, which is the exact opposite of the seven-headed beast again, isn't it? Because the seven-headed beast reflects the power of evil. Satan gives its power to the Antichrist, and the false prophet causes people and forces people to worship the Antichrist to the point where anybody that won't worship the Antichrist or his image is murdered or killed or cannot eat, cannot buy, cannot do anything, because if they don't have the mark on their forehead and they don't have the mark on their hand, they can't do anything. Okay? 
So that's why this world system and the beast work so hard together. But look at this. The glory of the Lord is shining from this angel. This angel is a servant of God. And you know, in Greek, the word angel can also mean messenger. And do you know that when you belong to Jesus Christ, when your sins are forgiven, that you become a messenger for God and the glory of God can shine out of you into the darkness and expose the darkness in people's lives? That's why when you even say anything about God, they don't want to hear it. They just want you to shut up and go away. And you haven't convicted them, and you haven't caused them, and you haven't accused them, but just because you start talking about God, they're immediately offended by it. Think about that. Okay? This is an actual angel. The glory of God. It says that the earth grew bright with his splendor, and he gave that shout. And the evil system of Babylon will be severely judged in verses 2 through 3. She's become a hope. Babylon is fallen. The great city is fallen. So this woman, which is also a city, which is also the whole system, is fallen. There will be a point where it's destroyed. Okay? Oh, and by the way, I heard something yesterday. I really got excited about it. Yesterday's the first day in three weeks that gas was under $5 a gallon. Guess how much it was? Four ninety eight. dollars <laughs> Four ninety eight. Woohoo! Get excited about that, can't you? But why? But we still have to have it, don't we? We still got to buy it. We still have to work around in this system, but we can't be up the system. We can't. I'm going to tell you if that all that was written a couple weeks ago, where the man said, if you don't do LGBTQ and CRT and intersection intersectionality in the schools, we're going to cut money off for kids to get them fed. I'm going to find a way for this church to start feeding kids for lunch. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to stay by and watch the devil trying to use the kids as a plan against us. I'm not going to do it. And anything like that comes straight from hell. Who would do that? But I'm just a Christian like everybody else. Satan doesn't want anybody to believe that he's anything like he really is. Okay? And I'm not saying the president is Satan. But I'm telling you, the Congress and the Senate and, and the presidency and the White House are all agents of Satan. <clears throat> They're working. Yeah. Nobody there's got the gonads to stand up and say, no, we're not going to do it. Because they get canceled because they don't have a big enough voice. Or they'll say, well, we'll cut your money on the next project that you want to add on to that bill. Mm -hmm. They're trying to pass a bill right now about something. I think it has to do with, um, it was some simple thing that they could have passed right through. But we know that no thing ever passes right through because everybody that's in the Senate and everybody that's in the Congress has to add something for themselves onto that bill. One of their pet things, one of their pet projects. Okay? I told you before, Terry used to worry when we first went into the ministry that she wouldn't have a place to live next Sunday. Because for 30 years I've been preaching the same way that I preach here on Sunday morning. And she was worried that people would be offended. And I said, you know what? When they're done with me, God will have another place for me to be. I'm not going to stop preaching God's word. I'm not going to quit exposing evil for what it is. I'm not. And what's who we've got to be, guys? That's who we've got to be, all of us. We've got to be willing to stand up for the truth. Now, this evil system that's Babylon is going to be severely judged, totally occupied by foul spirits and demons. Look at it right here. She's become a home for demons She's a hideout for every foul spirit, for every foul vulture, for every foul and dreadful animal. Okay? What's that first one? Shouts? And yes. Shouts. Animal shouts. Babylon is judged because it's totally occupied by foul spirits and demons. Again, these ten horns are here now. These kings who rule the commerce, they're going to give their authority here. But we've already read that this is eventually going to eat this and it's going to be gone. Because evil has a way of destroying itself. Okay? Now, she's caused all the nations in the kingdom of the world to fall into adultery. Anything that causes somebody to turn from God in the scripture is considered adultery. Anybody that participates in any kind of worship that does not honor God, the God of the Bible, 
what God wants, the Ten Commandments, the salvation message of the New Testament, anything that helps people worship that, anybody that participates in that is automatically considered adulterous. Okay? Also, idolatrous. Two different words, adulterous and idolatrous. Idolatry is when you put anything before God and you make that the most important thing in your life. Adultery is when you turn your back on God after he maybe was involved somehow or another and you go to worship something else. That's adultery. Okay? And God says he won't share his glory with anybody. And that he's a jealous God, but it's jealousy in a good way. What do we always think about with jealousy? You know, we think of envy green like Ken shirt, you know. I want what you have. I'm, I don't like what I have because you have what I don't have. And things like that. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. But God's zealous. That's a different word that could be used there. Which means he's going to fight for what's his. He is not going to let it go. Okay? And that's why we know that God will fulfill all the promises that he's made to us. And because we're a part of this system and we're, and we're affected by it, guys, I'm going to tell you what. Nobody can sit around anymore and just say, it'll go away. Nobody can sit around anymore and say, as long as it doesn't affect me, it's no big deal. But that's what's been going on for 60 years, like I talked about this morning. The church has sat with its head in the sand, believing it wasn't going to happen, because nobody wants to talk about this stuff. Nobody wants to talk about the hard things. And one of the hardest things that anybody will ever do in their life is live a committed life to Jesus. You know, intractable was the word Dave used about me. That means rebellious. Mm -hmm. Jesus rebelled, didn't he? But it wasn't sin. He rebelled against false religion. He rebelled against religion that was causing people to stumble. He rebelled against religion that was teaching about God that was way different than the God of the Bible and the God of the Scriptures. Jesus did not step back. You know, and everybody wants to think Jesus was a little mouse that wouldn't squeak unless you stepped on him. But you know what? He's standing in front of Pilate on the day that they whipped him and beat him and pulled out his beard and Pilate says, listen, I can let you go. I have the power over your life. Jesus looked at him and said, you don't have the power over my life. I choose to pick it up. I choose to lay it down. <laughs> right? Jesus was not afraid. He knew what he came to do. And see, what happens is this. If we know what's going to happen, and we know ahead of time, we have to be ready to warn other people about what's going to happen. Now, we don't have time frame on this, except this is going on in some aspect now. This is going on in some aspect now. This is going to come eventually. Nobody knows when. Everybody hopes after I'm gone. You know, I don't want to have to deal with all that. But what if not? What if God just says, hey, everybody in the world's had the chance to know about you, Jesus. Due to ham radio, due to the Bible being translated in almost every language in the world due to missionaries going from here to there to everywhere, due to the fact that now even the naked pygmies in the deepest darkest Africa have phones and they can get on social networking. What if God says, time for it all will be done? Can I tell you? It won't take long to sort the goats from the sheep. It won't take long to sort the pretenders from the true followers. There are going to be a lot of people who called themselves Christians and were convinced that they were, who are going to fall into this army. Right here. Because they've been so all about me that they're going to be worried that if I don't take that mark, I can't eat. I can't do anything. But the Bible says that anybody who takes that mark will be destroyed when this beast and the false prophet are destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire, which was, present, which was prepared for them and which will last for eternity. You see how real this stuff is, guys? It's not marshmallow fluff. It's the most real thing that we have to deal with in life. And people that we love are going to end up in hell. At their choosing. Because they choose to refuse the love and the grace and the mercy of God. And they're going to end up in hell because they don't want to be surrendered to Christ. Because of their appetites. They want what the world has to offer. And they're as drunk as Babylon is with what the world has to offer. 
Isn't that amazing? Anybody notice how our laws in the United States now are duplicitous? They're kicking people out of jail before the paper gets dry on the arrest warrant and they go out and rape and murder and kill somebody else? Isn't that amazing? And we see what's going on, but we're, 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 we're kind of callous to what's going on. We're kind of numb to what's going on. I don't know what to say there. <clears throat> All right, verse 4 through 5. Here we got a warning to God's people. Oh, well, if God's people are on the earth because everybody got snatched out of here, why does there need to be a warning to God's people? Okay? Look at verse 4 through 5. A warning to God's people from God. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled as high as the heaven, and God remembers her evil deeds. One more chance, come out. You hear that? We already know the Bible says come out from among them. We're God's called and chosen people. Come out from among the world. You can't be a friend with the world and be a friend with God. You can't. Come out, and right before all hell breaks loose, there's going to be one more chance. Come on out of there. Come on, whoever's left there, come on out. So, as we see this, we need to, this is the next line, we need to escape every ideological, spiritual, and physical form of behavior associated with Babylon. Do you hear that? We need to escape every ideological, spiritual, and physical form of behavior associated with Babylon. And what are we being told by the other side? We need to accept and expect that it's going to be the norm from now on that every ideological, spiritual, and physical form of behavior associated with Babylon is the new normal. Right? And now what we keep hearing? <clears throat> I get so mad this week. Because everybody wants to make everybody feel good about themselves and Fox News above all. The first story they did for Pride Month was about a little boy who was a drag queen. His parents started him being a drag queen when he's eight. Now he's 14 and he's fully bought into it. And just because everybody else is doing it, they did a whole story on it. They didn't do a story on it like, wow, this is a really bad thing. They were celebrating it. <coughs> this week? Has anybody heard the drag queens reading to kids at the public libraries? Have you heard any stories about that? In one of the big cities in the United States? They had drag queen hour at the library and some parents were outside protesting. Parents got arrested. Because they were protesting about children who are being exposed to every ideological, spiritual, and physical form of behavior associated with that line today. It's going on. Okay? Now let's, we got a couple scriptures we can look at real quick. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Somebody's going to have to keep an eye on time tonight because I don't think we're going to get all the way through this. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be partners with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between, be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will live in them and I will walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Watch this. Therefore... Go out from among unbelievers. Do you hear that right there? Come out from unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Paul warned the Corinthian church about it, because what were they all caught up in? Everything that glorifies me and doesn't glorify God. And do you know what's going on in the charismatic movement today and the faith movement today and all those movements? The exact same thing that was going on in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Read 1 and 2 Corinthians and you'll see exactly what's going on in the modern day Pentecostal movement. 
It's not about upbuilding other people. It's not about serving God and worshiping God. It's all about the person who's doing whatever they're doing. Okay? Paul says, come out of that false worship. Don't be unequally yoked either. And then as we look at James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10... James 4, 1 through 10 says this. What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme to kill and get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war and take away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what you want, what will give you pleasure. You adulterers. We talked about adultery, didn't we? You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourselves an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate about the spirit he has placed within us, and we should be faithful to him. And it gives us grace generously. As the scriptures all say, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Guys, I'm not making this stuff up. It's there. It's like Prego. It's in there, right? And as we look at these kind of scriptures and we look at these things, you can look up 1 John 2, 15 through 17 yourself when you have time. <clears throat> Next line. Those who choose Babylon over Christ will also suffer her punishment. Those who choose Babylon over Christ, it says in Revelation 18, come away from her people my people do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. Now again, that's not a woman. That's the city, which is the system, which is called Babylon, which is described as this harlot that sits on top of the beast. Okay? Let me ask you a question. I'm, I don't, I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm just going to ask you a question. Is it okay to eat in a restaurant that serves alcohol? Is it okay to eat at the restaurant at the casino? I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm asking you a question. And here's why. If we fund those entities that cause people to stumble, do we eventually at some point become complicit in that? Because there's a lot of restaurants that don't sell alcohol. And why would you need to eat at a restaurant at the casino when there are other restaurants that don't cause people to fall into gambling problems? I love the gambling commercials. Come gamble. But if you become addicted to gambling, we will help you. <laughs> Do you hear how evil begets evil? Now, I'm not saying don't go eat at your favorite restaurant. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if we have the choice between doing something that can cause great harm by participating in it or going somewhere else, you know, I don't shop at Target anymore. I don't eat Burger King anymore. Because they came out, they were the first two to come out for gay marriage, and they were the first two to come out for all this LGBTQ stuff. And I'm not supporting them, so they can support that. They don't get my money to send off of that stuff. I'm not going to get it. And if Gabriel Brothers decides they're going to do it, I'm not going to shop there, because that's where most of my clothes come from. <laughs> okay? I'll buy a Terry Southern machine, and we'll start living like they did on the farm. You see, we all have to be, we all have to decide how far we're going to interact in this. And I'm not saying that anybody who eats out there because you like the food, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, what is that money used for? 
Is it just used to buy the food? No, it all goes in one big pot, and it supports that. You know, in, in the state, when the state says we need to pass this new form of gambling so we can give money to our kids in schools and our old people and our fire departments and stuff like that. Why don't they take some of the money they're just wasting on everything else and use it for good purposes? Then we don't have to have another gambling house somewhere. And we've got to have gambling in Maryland because if we don't, Pennsylvania and West Virginia are going to get all the money from the gamblers. And when they first opened up the casino out here, I can't tell you how many calls we got because we're one of the closer churches out there. Oh, I need help from a family. I need help for this. I need help for that. You know, I had a guy come into the church one day when we still had the office over here. Dressed nice. He had on a real nice pair of blue jeans with the crease folded down the front of them where they'd been ironed. And he had on a pair of better cowboy boots than I could afford. A nice shirt and snaps on it. And a pack of cigarettes stuck in both pockets. He said, hey, I need to get $10 for gas. Well, I'd give him $10 for gas now because we wouldn't get him from here up the street. <laughs> right? $10 for gas when gas was $2 a gallon. was a different story. I said, Dude, you got ten dollars worth of gas in your pockets right there. Well, well, somebody gave them to me. I didn't buy them. I called BS on that right away. <laughs> right? And then I said, he said, I just need to get home fish tank. I said, well, you know, he wanted me to fill his tank up. And I said, no. I said, but you know what? I got to deal with them down there. Go down there with you. Well, let's put ten dollars worth in your car. But don't come back again. I said, Ron, you're not very compassionate. And I went and got in my car, which was not as nice a car as what he was driving. And when I went to go down to the old RGs down here, he went that way. <laughs> you see, when you hold people accountable, when you try to help them in a way that's godly and you're a good steward of what God has, they don't want to be a part of it. It's like the guy that stands out there on the corner by Wendy's. Anybody ever seen him? For a couple times now, he's had a woman sitting there with him on the ground, and she... You know, and um, somebody in our church knows that guy because they grew up with him and he's been bragging about him. It's 1100 to 1500 bucks a weekend standing down there with that sign in his hand. I'm not going to participate in that. I'm just not. Because that money is not being used for godly purposes, that's for sure. And whatever money I can give him, I can give to this church. And we know it's going to go to youth camp. We know it's going to go to support different ministries. We know it's going to go to support a clothing pantry, a food pantry, all those things. That's what I'm going to do with my money. I'm going to make sure that it's for godly purposes. Okay? Um, now, verses 6 through 8, there's a call for vengeance to be executed. It says here, Do to her as she has done to others. Double her penalty for all her evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others, so brewed twice as much for her. She glorified herself and lived in luxury, so match it now with torment and sorrow. She boasted in her heart, I'm queen on my throne, I am no helpless widow, and I have no reason to mourn. Therefore these plagues will overtake her in a single day. Death and mourning and famine, she will be completely consumed by fire, for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. In other words, God is going to eventually deal with this system right here. And it's not just going to be a spanking, and it's just not going to be an in the corner timeout. It's going to be wiped out. Gone. Because when Jesus comes back and evil's destroyed, there will be no place for this in the world. But the Bible says that we will rule and reign with Christ in the millennium. And Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron, but even in that, there are going to be people who are left over who didn't either follow Jesus or take the mark of the beast who are going to be left, and they're going to be the ones who populate the world during the time of the millennium, and they're going to rise up against God again once Satan is let back out of the pit after that thousand years. And so what happens is this. Even after a thousand years of Jesus reigning, ruling and reigning, there still will be somebody who's going to try to find a way to fight against him. Isn't that amazing? That just blows my mind. And that's why I say all the time, why would somebody reject the grace, mercy, and love of God to experience all the hurt and the hate and the evil that goes along with what's going on in this world? Why? Because the heart of man is exceedingly wicked and no one knows the depths of that wickedness. You know, just like that guy that caught up in Philadelphia a couple of years ago, that abortionist who had baby parts in jars all around in his basement and all around in his office. Just baby parts floating around in formaldehyde of all the babies that he'd aborted. How can you do that? How do the Nazis do what they did? 
How does Islam do what it does? How do they do that? Because man is wicked without God. How do we do it in our world today? We got the biggest sex trafficking war in the thing in the world going on right now. All these kids, what do they call them? Uh, unaccompanied minors. UA, UAMs or whatever they call them. Uncompanied minors. They're coming across the border with coyotes and then nobody ever sees them again. They're not going to stay with Aunt Tia. They're not. They're getting sucked into the system. It's terrible. Right? We've got to watch and see what's going on. Evil is working around us. God's voice continues to speak in regards to the ultimate punishment of all evil systems. That's the blank there. Verse 6, Babylon has been ruthless and oppressive. Her punishment will fit her crimes. A double portion of God's undiluted wrath. Remember, when we talk about God pouring out the wrath of His righteousness out of this wine press in chapter 16, it's undiluted wrath. You know, God spanks us today. God's going to destroy evil. He's going to tear it up. It's not just going to be a, you shouldn't have done that. It's going to be, here's what you get because you did that. And there's not going to be any way to get out of it. There's not going to be any way to get away from it. Okay? Now, verse 7, her boasting was arrogant and prideful as she opposed God. Look at verse 7. She glorified herself and lived in luxury. So match it now with torment and sorrow. That's what's called for in the midst of that. Because this world system doesn't matter who it harms as long as it's in charge. Does that make sense? And then verse 8, destruction will be swift as the Antichrist and his adherents are used by God for her demise. Look at verse 16 of chapter 17. Verse 16 of chapter 17, it says... The scarlet beast and his ten horns all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. So this evil system is going to destroy this evil system because it's part of God's plan. That evil will be destroyed. Okay? Just like God used Cyrus to help the people from Babylon go back to Jerusalem this morning to rebuild the temple... And he used the Persians to send other people and their money to go back and, and build the walls around. And when, when Nehemiah went, God used sinful people to accomplish his purposes and going to use evil to destroy evil. What time is it? Okay. We'll just stop right there. Um, we would have gotten all the way through this tonight, except I really wanted to go back and reiterate this stuff. I'm glad I did, because it seems like you guys don't have quite such puzzled looks on your faces. <laughs> um, and you know, that's the thing. There's no private interpretation of Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture, and that's why we went back and read 2 Corinthians 6, and that's why we went back and read those other passages of Scripture, so that you can see how that all works out. Um, I thank you guys for coming out. Anybody have a prayer request before we finish up tonight? Yeah, Doug Williams is having uh, his defibrillator replaced tomorrow. I guess when they put those jump starters in, you're only good for a certain amount of years, and then they got to take them back out. But they, that's all running up in his veins and all that kind of stuff, so they have to use a microscopic meat or laser to cut the vein back open, put the new part in, and pull the old part out. And There's always hazards that come along with that, but we know that God's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or prove and imagine. So um, we, we've already been praying for him. We'll continue to pray for him. Pray, continue to pray for uh, Keith, uh, that he recovers completely. It's so amazing. If you'd have seen him Friday, what he is today, it's just not even, it's not even possible that he could be that good that fast, except for people praying for him and God working with him. Uh, God is amazing. He is amazing. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. We, we thank you for your word, God. Um, a lot of people don't read it, and a lot of people don't understand it. And Father, I thank you for people who want to understand it, and I thank you for the fact that your scripture tells us exactly what it means. And Father, John is using language to describe something that nobody's ever seen before in terms that we can understand, and since the original total and complete interpretation of that is gone, we have to go to your word to find the answers to what we're seeing. The, our, the people that John wrote this letter to knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew why he was saying these things. And Father God, I pray that as we hunger and thirst after righteousness, that you would help us to be bold in our walk for you, that you would help us to take a stand in this world where evil seems to be constantly and continually winning. 
And Father, I pray that you would be glorified and that you would be honored. It's not for us. It's not for our glory. It's not to say, wow, look how brave they are. It's not, not to say, look how crazy they are. It's not to say, look, he's attractive. He's rebellious. He's, he's something else. But, you know, Jesus was a maverick and so am I. He was not okay with the status quo. He did not come to, uh, to uplift it or to say that it was okay. He came to preach the truth. And the truth that he first preached was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Lord, we're closer to it now than we've ever been. And we're seeing things happen that have never that nobody's experienced for a long, long time. Since the time of the days of the Roman Empire, when Christians were being killed just because they were your followers. And Father, we still have some time left in this country where we can help people one at a time through loving them, through sharing your word with them, to help them understand that you're God, and we can show them by what your word says that your word is true and that you're faithful. And they can have hope because you're their God. And Father, if we didn't need to know all this stuff and we weren't even going to be here, it wouldn't even be in the scripture for us to read. And we can't read back into it what we wanted to say. <clears throat> we have to read out of it what you've already told us. So God, thank you for everybody that's come out tonight. Be with, be with Keith as he continues to recover. Be with Doug as he goes to this procedure tomorrow. Father, I pray that your will would be done in both their lives. And I pray that you would give us all strength to live for you, to love you, to walk with each other as we serve you together, God. Because if one walks down the road by herself and they fall in the ditch, how are they going to get out? But if two are walking together and one falls in the ditch, the other one can at least reach down a hand and help them up. And if one is on a cold night trying to stay warm and can't stay warm, how are they going to do that? But if two are together, they can at least sit back to back and keep each other warm. And your word says that a quarter of two strands is not easily broken. A quarter of one strand is easily broken, but a quarter of three strands is not. And Father, I pray that you would always be the third strand in between us, that you would be the glue that binds us, that you would be the one who gives us power through the resurrection of Christ and boldness through the power of the Holy Spirit to be your witnesses in this world. Father, we watch so-called churches and so-called denominations bowing at the altar of Babylon and bowing at the altar of the Antichrist week by week. And Father, I pray that you would always give us a willingness to give a reason for the hope that lies within us with gentleness and respect. And Father, that we would see many lives changed on this little corner right here in Cumberland, Maryland. God, I believe that you've made us a church for the tri-state. We reach people from Pennsylvania. We reach people from West Virginia. We reach people from Maryland. And I pray that your witness would go out of this place in your believers and that they would tell everybody that they know the amazing things that you're doing, God. And I pray that we would gather for way more celebration services like we had last Sunday and the future that comes ahead. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for answering our prayers. And God, we give you glory and honor and praise because you're the only one who deserves it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.